good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Beam. I'm uh, managing director of the McCourtney Institute for Democracy, and it's my pleasure to uh, to welcome you today. Uh, just a couple of items before we start. Uh, first of all, I want to remind you that our next speaker is Daniel Allen, uh, who's a political theorist at, at Harvard and also uh, co-chair of a prestigious group that produced a report called Our Common Purpose. And uh, she will be here a week from tomorrow on Thursday, the 25th. And then one month later on uh, March 25th, uh, we'll be hosting the 2020 Brown Democracy Medal winner, Sergio Popovich, um, um, who was a resistor in uh, uh, Milosevic's uh, regime in Serbia. Uh, anyway, I, I encourage you all to come. Uh, they're going to be terrific speakers. You can find more about both of them, and you can register at our website, democracy.psu.edu. Also, if you have been to any of our virtual events before, uh, you know the drill. Uh, please type in your questions in the Q&A box and Jenna will moderate after uh, Anne's talk. So uh, to introduce our speaker, uh, it is genuinely hard to know where to start with Anne Applebaum. She is as accomplished an, a journalist as she is an author, as she is an historian. She is a one woman trifecta. Uh, her work focuses uh, mostly on the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. And as you will, you will hear, she is using her knowledge of that region. Um, <laughs> she's using her knowledge of that region to help us understand what is going on here at home and in other established democracies. Uh, it's for this reason that we first thought to invite her. I'm, I'm actually teaching a class this spring called uh, Democratic Erosion, and I assigned Anne's account of life in Poland, how things were in the early 90s and how they are now. I chose her work because it is clear and incisive and also because it makes for really compelling reading. As she often does, she combines her amazing personal experience with thoughtful historical analysis. Anne was a columnist for the Washington Post for 15 years and a member of the editorial board there. She was a correspondent for The Economist covering the collapse of communism in Poland in the late 80s, early 90s. As for where else her writing has appeared, it would be a lot faster to list those important publications, both uh, here and abroad, for which she has not written. Uh, she's currently a staff writer for The Atlantic, uh, which is just an indispensable publication right now. Uh, her article last year uh, called History Will Judge the Complicit is just a stunning piece of writing, and I, I really recommend it to you. As for her academic bona fides, she is a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies and the Agora Institute, where she co-directs ARENA, a program on disinformation and 21st century propaganda. She has lectured and received honorary degrees from many of the finest universities in the world. Finally, Anne is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian. Her books include Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine, Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe, 1944 to 1956, and The Gulag, A History. All three are prize winning and all three have been translated into two, over two dozen languages. Her latest book, Twilight of Democracy, will be the subject of her talk today. Anne Applebaum, thank you very much for joining us and the floor is yours. So thank you very much for that um, really um, extraordinary introduction. Um, I don't know how jokes work on Twitter, but it does remind me of a, a famous story of, of Dr. Kissinger, who upon receiving an introduction like this one, although it was of course in real life, you know, at some fancy club probably in New York and not on Zoom, um, um, you know, or sorry, sorry, when upon, upon being introduced by someone who said, um, you know, and now we will hear from Dr. Kissinger who needs no introduction, he stood up and said, I may not need an introduction, but I so enjoy them. So um, that was a very enjoyable introduction. Thank you for, for being so generous. Um, 
Uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, sorry that I'm not with you in person. Um, I prefer to meet people, particularly students in real life. Um, and I hope maybe this will be the first of, you know, the first of, of what will eventually be more meetings and, you know, maybe we can, we can follow up again. Um, I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about the book that I wrote and why I wrote it, because that will, that's also an introduction um, into what's happening in our democracy, both here in the US um, and in parallel democracies in, in other countries. Um, um, as, as Chris said, I, it, it begins with a piece that, um, you know, it, it, the thinking for this originally went into an article for The Atlantic, but really the thinking for it began with me contemplating a party that I gave in 1999. Um, uh, in about 2016, 2017, I started to think about this party. And it's not because it was such an amazing party or because I'm such an amazing hostess or anything like that. It was just because the party took place at a particular moment. It was in millennial party. So it was 1999. It was 10 years after the fall of communism. Um, and because I realized um, almost 20 years later that about half the people or a third of the people who were at the party were no longer my friends. Um, and this wasn't a personal division or it wasn't, uh, you know, but it actually reflected a deep political change in that group. And it wasn't just me who was no longer speaking to this group. It was the other one half of the party was no longer speaking to the other half of the party. Um, and I realized that I was living through um, one of those really important and pivotal historical moments um, when the intellectual consensus uh, you know, in a given place and in a given time begins to change. Um, and I should say the party was in Poland. Um, it took place at a house that my husband and I bought as a complete ruin. His family really bought it in the 1980s and then we restored it very slowly. Um, and by 1999, it had been restored and that it had a roof. Um, it didn't have very much furniture, which of course made it great for a New Year's Eve party because we had these big um, empty rooms. Um, but the point is that most of the guests came from a particular milieu. They were mostly Polish. There were some American friends and some British friends, um, but they were mostly Polish and they were mostly from what you could roughly call the younger end of the anti-communist movement. So they were people who'd been activists, they'd been journalists, um, mostly in school or in college. They weren't, you know, we were not We were a slightly younger generation than the, than the leading dissidents, um, but they were certainly part of the anti-communist camp. Um, and in that sense, they shared a worldview. You know, they agreed that um, to, you know, communism was bad, that what Poland wanted instead was democracy, and they wanted Poland to be part of international institutions like NATO, like the European Union. They imagined Poland being integrated with the rest of Europe, being part of Europe. Um, and all of, you know, and, and nobody, in, nobody in the room that night would have really disagreed. I mean, if we thought about it, we might have found things we disagreed with, but on the main issues, at that moment in time, um, we were all in general agreement. Um, 20 years later, uh, we are not. Um, 20 years later, that group, which I would also roughly characterize as kind of mostly center right, maybe center of some center left, some center right, has split. And one part of the group is now, can only really be described as radical right. Um, they are they are now some quite, nobody was famous at the time, but now some of them are quite well-known journalists um, political strategists, in a few cases, members of parliament um, for the, the, the radical Polish ruling party, which is called Law and Justice, um, and which is a, it's best described as a kind of nationalist Catholic party, um, which has since coming to first taking power in 2015, has very systematically chipped away at the foundations of Polish democracy, um, starting with the politicization of the courts, um, unconstitutional court packing um, uh, was, was, their, was their first move um, much more recently, and you can read an editorial about it today in the Washington Post. Um, they have begun to try to restrict um, private media. They're, they, they're taxing advertising in private media. They're trying to kill off private media. Meanwhile, they're subsidizing state media, which they control. Um, and state media in Poland, it's, it's very hard to explain if you're outside of the country, but it's very virulent. I mean, it's, it's, um, they run smear campaigns against people. It's very actively xenophobic. It's very actively homophobic. Um, at times it's anti-Semitic. Um, and some people that I know now work for state media and they are responsible for this kind of 
um, this kind of programming. And it's a kind of language that's used in a, a kind of um, you know, way of making televised propaganda that you, we have not had in Poland um, since before the fall of communism. Um, so they, they, you know, so this, this group of people who were, I mean, they weren't exactly my friends, but they were in my milieu have changed. Um, they've moved from being center-right, pro-EU, I don't know, pro-transatlantic pro alliance into something that's much different and much more extreme. They are now often anti-European. They're very critical of Western institutions. Many of them would actually like to leave them um, and their orientation um, is quite different and their, and their language is much, is, 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 is much different. And I, I would no longer call them, um, you know, I mean, they would, they would be offended if you said they weren't Democrats, but I, they're certainly no longer liberal Democrats. And they certainly hope to use their power to change the balance in democracy. You know, one of the, one of the mistakes that many of us make, um, certainly I made until recently, was thinking that democracy was something that ended with a coup d'etat. You know, I don't know, tanks in the street and some junior military officers surrounding the presidential palace and, you know, Swan Lake or something playing on TV. And, you know, um, that's not how democracy ends now in the modern world. Democracy ends when you have autocratic political parties, very often these authoritarian populist parties, either from the right or from the left, who take power and then begin to undermine institutions. So, you know, the courts, the press, sometimes the bureaucracy, sometimes state media, sometimes private media, um, and who take what should be a, a level playing field and tilt it so that it becomes difficult or in some cases impossible for their opponents to win the elections. Um, you know, if you think about it, democracy requires something almost inhuman of all of us, you know, it requires, in order for it to work, it requires this kind of consensus. Um, it requires all of us to, you know, if you, if you win an election, it requires you to say, okay, I've won, but I have to preserve all of these institutions in place. Again, the media, the courts, the even playing field, the neutrality of some, of some institutions. Um, you have to preserve all of that so that your opponents can beat you in four years. And that's, you know, for some people that proves impossible. And then of course, conversely, if you lose, you have to be able to say, okay, I lost, tough luck, you know, but, but, but my opponents have the right to rule, let them rule for four years. Um, when you begin to lose this sensibility, this idea that, okay, we, there's enough of a consensus um, so that even my political opponents, I can, I can stand to let them be in charge for year, four years. Once you lose that, then you really lose um, you begin to lose democracy itself. And that has progressed, although I would say Poland is still a democracy, it has progressed quite far there in that the institutions are so tilted, the playing field is so undermined, um, even the use now very slowly of prosecution of people who the government doesn't like, the state doesn't like is now beginning. Um, all of this is, it represents, you know, a much, and it's a much different kind of politics and political change. So political system. So, my, the, my book begins with this setup and, and thinking about this prompted me, you know, to then reflect on the fact that this kind of shift, the one that I experienced personally, these are my friends and some of them later on attacked me. I mean, that's a long story, but they, you know, I'm, I'm sometimes featured in their, in their rants and their, you know, and their smear campaigns. Um, the shift that I had witnessed was actually pretty similar to a similar kind of shift that took place on the center right in a lot of countries. Um, a version of it also happened in Britain. Um, it's a little bit different. The issue at stake is Brexit and Britain's relationship to the EU and the outside world. But it was a similar process of the, of the center right, which had been unified you know, under Mrs. Thatcher, um, had a very clear sense of itself and of Britain's role in the world, divided, split, um, and was eventually taken in a completely different direction by a part of the party, a kind of um, you know, we're taken one way. And of course, it's also very similar to something that happened in the Republican Party too. And I wasn't, most of the last 30 years I've been outside the United States, but I've had enough friends and enough contacts in Washington, especially among journalists, um, that I was able to watch a very similar split inside the party. And, you know, we all saw it pretty graphically in the last few years as a part of the party became, you know, for lack of a better word, and we're eventually going to find a better word, Trumpist or headed in this authoritarian direction. And, and some people either left the party 
or stayed in and tried to shift it in a different direction. And in some cases, um, you know, very actively campaigned against Trump as Republicans. Um, but that shift is something that has happened in a lot of places. Um, I, you know, I, I, you, you can find a version of it in Spain. You can find a version of it in Germany. Um, you can find versions of it in almost every, um, in almost every European country and every democracy. And indeed, you know, one of the oddities of the current moment is that you can look around the world um, and you can see countries that really have very little in common. I mean, the United States, Brazil, Hungary, the Philippines, Turkey, um, these are all democracies where some version of that story has taken place, has unfolded. And so the, the book, you know, um, sets out to answer the question to explain why. And I don't have a single answer. And uh, it's not one of those books, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a saying in publishing, you know, that if you can't sum up the topic of your book in one sentence, you shouldn't even be writing it. Um, but this, this book doesn't have a single answer because I don't think there is a single answer. Not because the answers are different from country to country. Actually, there, there's quite a lot of similarity across geography, but because they differ from person to person. And the reasons why people have made those choices and gone that direction um, aren't, aren't all the same. The one thing I would say that unifies the Polish far right, the American alt right, um, the, the, the more radical Brexiteers in Britain, um, you know, the Vox party in Spain, the one thing that unifies all of them, and this is, a, this is important, is a sense of disappointment. Something isn't the way it was supposed to be. Um, sometimes it's personal disappointment. And you, I, in, in, in Poland, you can find numerous examples of this. Um, you know, people who say, I was a solidarity activist, I was an anti-communist activist in the 1980s. How come I'm not editor of a newspaper now? Or how come I'm not prime minister? Or why wasn't I successful in business? Um, you know, the, 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 you know, the competition and the, you know, the train of events that happened in the 90s and the 2000s didn't necessarily give a victory to everyone who felt they deserved one. Um, and this is quite common in the, in the former communist world. You know, I, you know, I was on the right side of history. Why haven't I gotten some kind of payback? Um, and there's a version of this though, even in non-communist countries. You know, I was, I was right, we were correct. Um, why are we still outsiders? Why doesn't the establishment accept us? Um, why aren't I invited to speak to the Dartmouth Alumni Association when, you know, when my colleagues um, who, who work for CNN um, are, and you know, here I am a Fox News presenter and here I'm thinking of a specific person, um, I'm not invited to that. So there's a, there's a, sometimes there's a sense of personal grievance um, that helps explain why people go in a radical direction um, because the, the radical politics, um, you know, is often, often uses the language of grievance and the language of resentment um, and that appeals to them. And also they are the people who articulate it. So this is, I'm, I'm talking right now mostly about intellectuals, journalists, you know, political spin doctors, um, people who are educated. I'm not talking about the mass of voters. That's a slightly different story, why, why they're attracted to, to authoritarianism. But, I'm, but you know, this, is, this, is about, this is about intellectuals and educated, um, very educated in some cases, people who are. So disappointment, um, disappointment with the meritocracy that didn't work out the way I thought it was, um, disappointed, but even more so, Disappointment with what's happened to my country. Um, this isn't the country I thought I wanted to live in. Um, this isn't what we were planning, you know, b before communism fell. Um, or in the American case, this isn't the country that looks like the one I grew up in. You know, I grew up in a small town. Most people looked alike there. We were mostly, you know, white and, and Protestant. Um, I don't, you know, now I'm living in this world where there's all these different kinds of people with all these different demands. How come I have to live in that world? This isn't the kind of country that I wanted it to be. Um, this isn't the, you know, you know, or this isn't the, you know, we don't have the role in the world that I thought we sh would have or should have. Um, we aren't, um, we aren't admired as we once were. Um, we've lost our influence. We aren't as powerful as we once were. Um, our, our, our education isn't as good as it used to be. Our, you know, our, um, you know, our, our, you know, our cities don't look the way cities used to look. 
Um, and so there's this, and this kind of disappointment, um, you know, sometimes, and, and I have to, well, I want to say this carefully for, you know, what I'm guessing is um, a mostly liberal audience, and I'm a liberal myself. Um, so, so to make this clear, sometimes there's a, this disappointment is reflect something real and that there has really been a lot of change um, in the last 30 years. In fact, we've lived through the most incredible amount of change, you know, rapid economic change, um, extraordinary demographic change um, in the United States. You know, the, 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 you know, the growth of, you know, this, you know, really genuinely multicultural society for the, for the first time. Um, sociological change, you know, the acceptance of the change of, you know, mores around women and women working and marriage, um, the integration of, uh, you know, gay people and gay marriage as, you know, into, into you know, as a, as a completely acceptable and indeed, you know, indeed now rather sort of banal um, part of life. Um, those are real changes. Um, and they, you know, and for some people they mark, they, they create questions, you know, are we changing so fast that we left something behind? Is the life that I knew 30 years ago gone? Um, and there's another aspect to this too, which is that we have also lived through, and this is, this is more recent, a genuine change in the status of the United States. Um, we were, you know, for six decades after the Second World War, um, we were absolutely the dominant world power. And our, uh, you know, our political system even when it wasn't always admired at home, and we even when it always didn't live up to its, um, you know, to its promise at home, was admired and copied and imitated all over the world. Um, and you know, we we all became used to this idea that you know, almost as if democracy was some inevitable thing that um, that American democracy was 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 strong, and you know, sooner or later the rest of the world would want to be like us. <clears throat> And of course, the 1989 moment when the communist system fell and so many um, European countries and, and others um, did try to become democracies. I mean, we, we, we understood this as, a, as some kind of inevitability. Um, and of course, the rise of China um, and the growing power of China and the fact that China did not choose to follow our path and has chosen something very different, um, I think has given people the sense that we, you know, we aren't maybe as influential and big as we used to be. Um, add to, on top of that, some very real blows to um, American, and I should say American and Western prestige, um, and, and not just prestige, but the, the feeling that we're competent, you know, that we're competent and therefore deserve to be leaders. Um, you know, one of them obviously is the financial crisis of 2008 and nine, which wasn't so much, and, it's, and of course it had a big economic effect on people, but it also had a psychological effect. You know, we thought these people knew what they were doing. And by the way, this is something you hear in Europe as well. You know, these bankers, you know, they understood these flows of money and we, under, we, we thought they knew what they were doing. It turned out that they didn't um, and they weren't really in control of the system. And that was a big blow to, um, you know, to the kind of package of, 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 you know, American democracy plus prosperity plus competence, you know, this vision of, of, of what Western democracy was. Um, and another big blow was, it wasn't so much the, it wasn't that we lost the war in Iraq, it was that it somehow, um, it wasn't this, neither Iraq nor Afghanistan were great successes and the feeling that the United States was involved in things that could, you know, not, and not just the United States, the rest of the West was, was you know, was waging wars and was, um, was, you know, was not succeeding. And so this feeling of failure, this, you know, the rise of other countries, um, coupled with the sense that something very deep is changing and I can't fix it, um, this for a lot of people was, has driven them in the direction of very radical politics. Um, and I should say that this, you know, radicalism and even violence in politics um, very often do begin exactly this way. I mean, if you look back over history, if you look at the history of um, the 1930s, or even if you go back further, um, if you look at the, you know, the 19th century, um, if you look at how Germans felt in Germany during the era of, of in rapid industrialization in their country, um, if you look at, at France and which, you know, at the same era, very rapid change, <clears throat> you get a very similar kind of disappointment. Um, in my book, I quote the work of a, you know, of a German writer um, from the 19th century, 
um, who writes about the past, and this is already, this is, you know, this is in the 19th century, already is writing about the past in a way that sounds amazingly familiar to the nostalgists of our own time. So he's already talking about making Germany great again, you know, in the in the in the mid 90 mid and late 19th century. He's talking about, you know, we were great once, we had heroes once, now all we have are these petty squabbling politicians. You know, he's he's already looking backwards and thinking about a, you know, an earlier era. Um, and that same kind of nostalgia, that same kind of feeling that we want to restore something that was, that we've lost something, that we're missing something. Um, you know, and on top of that, that I am owed something, and because of these changes, I'm not succeeding. This is a this is a package um, that repeats itself over time. Um, we, you, you know, there's a version of it that exists in Germany. There's a version of that you get in France at the same time. Um, and of course, we find this kind of restorative nostalgia, this desire for res you know restoring the past because the present is so unsatisfactory. You can find it now in the United States. You can find it in Poland. You can find it in Hungary. You can find it in England. You can find it in in France and Germany. Um, it's a very common feeling. Um, and the and although it's true, of course, that conservatives, um, um, you know, in, even in the traditional sense, um, thought of themselves as conserving things and trying to keep the best of the past and maybe changing a little bit as as you know as we move into the future. This is what we know as Burkean conservatism that it changes, as as the writer Edmund Burke described things change slowly. Um, there has come a point for a lot of people who were conservatives where they think that's not happening fast enough. You know, I, it's not good enough to conserve a few things. I actually want the past back, you know, as it was. Um, and wanting the past back means you have to smash up things or destroy them in the present um, in order to bring them back. And this is the, again, this is the, um, this is the inspiration for for radical politics. Um, so again, the, the the book doesn't it doesn't it, it doesn't have a single answer, but it describes the trajectories of many people who made a series of choices and often end up in very radical places, either openly anti-democratic, um, you know, some sometimes even advocating violence, but certainly being very very opposed to the status quo and looking for 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 ways to undermine it. Um, let me finish. I mean, I'm very happy to expand this in any direction that you all want. Um, I, I can talk about you know, American politics, I can talk about European politics or East European politics or in Russian politics even. But let me finish um, just my opening remarks by um, trying to get you as, a, as an American audience to reflect on you know, what all this means for how we think about democracy in America. Um, I think one of the great mistakes that we made um, over the last several decades was precisely that we believed this promise of inevitability. Um, we believed that, you know, democracy was a thing like running water, you know, that you just, you didn't have to do very much. Um, you could just let some professional politicians do their jobs and you could get on with, I don't know, making money or painting pictures or whatever it is that you wanted to do. And like running water coming out of a tap, you wouldn't have to make any special effort to make democracy work. Um, and this was, of course, you know, this was the, you know, that famously misinterpreted essay, um, The End of History, that was written, this famous essay by Francis Fukuyama that was written, you know, after the 1989 revolutions, this feeling that history is over, liberal democracy is inevitable, um, none of us have to try very hard anymore because everything's going in America's direction. This was a huge mistake. Um, it's in some ways an understandable mistake because it reflected the experience of everybody who was alive at that time, at the time the essay was written. Um, you know, in 1989 or 1990, if you were living in the United States or even if you were living in, in Europe, you had just lived through several decades of democratic success, not just American success, but the, the camp of American democracies. Um, and you had seen one wave after the next of countries um, you know, having democratic revolutions, deciding to become democracies for Southern Europe, then Eastern Europe, um, you know, East Asia, um, you know, South America, Africa, you know, one, one region after the next followed in this path. And so, if, you know, it was very natural to think in 1990 that this is just the way things are and the way they're always going to be. Um, but this is, of course, not how the founding fathers of the United States thought, and they're not how 
anybody who's ever studied democracy very hard thought. Um, if, you, if you go back and look at what the men who wrote the constitution in 1789 were talking about, it's, it's truly fascinating because they were very focused, I mean, fixated on ancient Greece and Rome. Um, these were the, the democracies um, that they were using as models. And what they were particularly focused on was the, the era of the Roman Republic. So it wasn't about the Roman empire. It was about the year of the Roman Republic and the fall of, of that Republic. And they were all reading either, you know, either translations or in some cases kind of popularized versions of texts by Cato and Cicero, who were the two, great, two of the great writers of that era. Um, and they were using their experiences to feed into their understanding of democracy. Um, they understood that democracy was circular, that, or that politics is circular, history is circular. And, and you know, and things you know, nothing is nothing is inevitable, and there are no upward trajectories. And one of the reasons they designed our now somewhat rickety constitution the way they did was because they wanted there to be a balance of power. They didn't want the executive to be too either too strong or too weak. And what they were thinking about all the time was the how democracy had fallen in ancient Rome, how the people had become entranced by Caesar, the demagogue, um, and how the Roman Republic had lost its. Um, you know, had lost its, uh, you know, it lost its, lost its democratic essence. Um, and it's even, if it's even a little bit strange, I mean, you have the, you know, the Americans looking back to Roman writers who were themselves also looking back to an, a, an earlier era. I mean, you see how nostalgia can play in, um, in different ways at different times, but it was the, but their understanding was absolutely that democracy can fail. Um, and they didn't have any doubts about that. And so this this idea that democracy is inevitable, which has, I think, been very dangerous um, because it made us all, you know, we all took our eyes off the ball. We didn't pay attention um, as our, some of our institutions grew weaker, as voting participation dropped, as, um, as and even as the as radicalism grew, uh, growing out of this, you know, this disappointment that I've described, um, we lost, we took our eye off the ball and we didn't, and, and we didn't do anything about it. So if I was going to, leave you with one idea. Um, it, it's that that although I wrote a book called Twilight of Democracy, and although I, I, I guess I'm, I write some pretty gloomy articles um, in the Atlantic and elsewhere, um, I wanted to leave you with the reflection that history is always radically open um, and that nothing is inevitable. Neither decline is inevitable. It's, there is no reason why either the United States or Western Europe or Eastern Europe have to decline. There's no reason why our civilization needs to end. Um, but nor is there any reason why it will definitely succeed. There is no, you know, there's nothing magic about our form of democracy or our form of civilization. You know, it too can come to an end. Um, and the, the, you know, and the difference between it succeeding or failing is of course a million different decisions taken by people like you, you know, people in this audience who are interested, who are, who are active citizens um, and participating in democracy, in, in local democracy, in regional democracy, in state democracy, or joining in, you know, political institutions or even non-political institutions um, that, you know, that, that, that put you in contact with, you know, your, your fellow citizens. Um, this is a really important civic act. You know, we need to stop treating democracy like it's running water and instead, it's more as if it's, you know, you know, we have to, we actually have to walk over to the well, we have to pull the water out with a rope, and then we have to carry the bucket, you know, back to the house if we want to have water. Um, we should think about it as something that we all have to participate in, that we, you know, we will have to make some effort um, if we wanted to succeed in the future. And if we want to, um, if we want to prevent um, you know, the, 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 the disappointment and the radicalization of some of our fellow citizens from dominating our political discourse and from, and from changing the, the nature of our, of our country. Um, I'll stop there. As I said, I'm happy to pursue any of these themes in, in whatever direction you want. And thank you again for listening. Great. Uh, wonderful, Anne. Uh, thank you so much. And just, just a reminder uh, to everyone, you can put your questions in the Q&A box uh, and we'll get to as many as we can over the next 30 minutes or so here. Um, so Anne, just to, to pick up on, on something that, um, you, that I, I know is in your book, you, you write about uh, how the, the 
the Cold War and kind of the, the fight uh, against communism was something of a, a uniting force for liberals and conservatives. Uh, can you say more um, about that and, and how how those dynamics changed once the you know uh, Cold War ended, the wall fell, all those kind of things? Yeah, I do think, um, particularly in retrospect, I mean, there's, there are two senses in which the Cold War consensus was very important. Um, one, as you say, um, it put liberals and conservatives in at least one narrow sphere of issues, it put them on the same side. So although there were deviations at different times and there were different arguments made in the 60s and there were arguments about you know, Vietnam, whether this was a good, you know, this was a good way to oppose communism or not. I mean, it, but there was a, there was a general consensus in the, in both political parties that, um, that we were a democracy and that we were opposed to, you know, dictatorship and totalitarianism, you know, as it existed, particularly in, in at least in that form um, in many parts of the world. And that gave some element of consistency and created a basis for um, for common, you know, um, you know, for a common foreign policy, at least um, for, you know, for many decades. I mean, we didn't always agree on everything else. And, um, you know, as I said, I, I, I'm, I'm generalizing here to make the point, but yeah, I do think it created at least one area of, of common consensus. I mean, there's another way in which it functioned, um, you know, in the, you know, not only did it create some consensus inside the United States, it also created consensus inside the Republican party. Um, both, both of our political parties have always been grand coalitions and they contain huge ranges of people. Um, but the Republican Party in particular has always had a big range um, from, it includes libertarians, you know, social conservatives, um, so-called country club Republicans, you know, who are just, you know, want the establishment to stay there. Um, people who are, who care about big business, people who care about small business, you know, whose, whose interests are sometimes not aligned. Um, you know, and in more recent years, quite a lot of blue collar um, voters as well. You know, that's a big, strange ideological group to keep together. And one of the things that did keep it together in the past was this consensus that we're all pro-democracy and we're all fighting communism. I mean, that was kind of the, the very basic level and that was useful. And once that was gone, I mean, I actually think the consensus was, um, it lasted probably longer than it would have done because of the because of 9-11. Um, but once it was gone, many people in that party sort of, you know, woke up and looked at one another and said, wait, what, you know, if we're not talking about communism, but instead we're talking about, I don't know, gay marriage, you know, or taxation, you know, um, then actually, what do I have in common with these people? Um, and so it, it, you know, it, 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 it worked in that way too. I mean, there's, there's another really important way in which the Cold War affected our democracy that I've been thinking about myself a lot recently. Um, that's just, a, and I'm just thinking about it experimentally, which is we always have this idea that it was the United States that spread democracy and that it was our membership of the transatlantic alliance that kept Europe stable. And, you know, our presence helped keep France and Italy on this democratic path and so on. I think more and more that it also worked the other way. In other words, that these big alliances, these big institutions that we belong to, you know, NATO, you know, the the, the, the whatever, the, the later on the, the G7, the, you know, the close links to other big democracies, that these also had an impact on us, you know, that they were part of what kept our democracy stable. And maybe it's, you know, we making, you know, building our foreign policy and our national identity around this idea, you know, that we believe in rule of law, you know, that we believe in independent courts, that we believe in freedom of press and association. Um, that we believe in, you know, in, you know, that, that leaders should be chosen by an electoral system. Once we made that our kind of international cause and label, I think that had an effect on people at home as well. And so, you know, to be, you know, it just meant that to be American, you accepted these rules or these, you know, these, these habits or these norms. Um, and that was, that was very normal. And, and by the way, I don't think it's an accident at all that the very first American president since 1945 not to respect the transatlantic alliance, you know, and and actively to dislike um, NATO, um, you know, is is also the American president who who was responsible for one of the greatest, you know, attacks on. I mean, it's actually not just the insurrection of the Capitol, but also going back over four years, was responsible for these constant verbal and other kinds of attacks on 
on on all kinds of elements of our system and then eventually on the electoral system. I mean, I think there I think there's a link between those things. Yeah, and, and you know, speaking of of um, Donald Trump's attacks on on the election and and its legitimacy, uh, can you help us understand how those messages played outside the U.S.? Um, well, I'm not going to pretend that they played super well. You know, mm. <laughs> um, I mean, for, you know, for, it's funny. I, I have talked to a lot of. Um, uh, you know, a lot of non-American. I was I was abroad. I was actually in Poland when the you know the, when the events took place, and I since then spoken to a lot of friends, but also journalists and others um, from around Europe and even around the world. Um, and the and the rea you know part of the reaction is actually one about competence. Like, where were your police, and why did how could that have happened? And we just assumed everything in Washington is well guarded, and why wasn't it? I mean, some of it is a is a you know questioning what's happened to our competence, but also, of course, you know, you know what was that attack on the Capitol? What did it represent? That wasn't Republicans attacking Democrats. Um, that was a group of people who were attacking Congress itself and who were trying to prevent Congress from recognizing and naming the next president. Specifically, trying to prevent Mike Pence from doing it, um, the vice president. And they were there not as Republicans. They were there as an anti-systemic group. You know, they were they were against the system. They don't believe. They don't listen to it. They don't believe our electoral officials, and you know, in Georgia, or Arizona, or, or Michigan, or Pennsylvania. Um, and they were convinced that, you know, they had, you know, their their that that the election had been stolen. Um, and so, so yes, I mean, I think it was understood around the world as an attack on democracy, which is what it was. Um, and the, you know, it was the you know, it was the, you know, it was a kind of symbolic, very photogenic graphic illustration of a process that they'd all been watching, which is this American decline. Um, and in a, in a way that's very hard to quantify, I do think it matters not, and it funnily enough, it matters less for us. I mean, of course it matters for us. I mean, to be careful how I say it, but I mean, but it also matters a lot for people in the non-democratic world who have long looked to America as an example and, and, and looked for American support. Um, people in places like Belarus um, or Hong Kong, you know, or Russia actually, um, who, had, who have demonstrated in favor of democracy because it somehow seemed to undermine the big idea of democracy. And I mean, of course, um, particularly in Russia, um, but also in China, the events have been and will be used as a way of saying, you guys want this democracy, be careful what you wish for, look how chaotic and ridiculous America is, you know, there's nothing for you there. Um, and so it will become part of anti-American and anti-democratic propaganda. And, 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 the, and the victims of that will be, you know, the democratic opposition um, in those countries. Yeah. So, you know, you, you mentioned uh, before that the both the uh, Republican and Democratic parties in, in the U.S. are these big coalition parties. And we've seen, uh, you know, both efforts on the on the the, the, the Republican side to create a, a patriot party or maybe more of a, of a center right party. These are sort of rumblings out there. I mean, what do you what do you make of, of those efforts? And, you know, is is something like that? feasible in, in, in the US or you know how how might it play out? So I was actually I, 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 I missed it because I had to do something else. I was actually invited to be on a call a few days ago, which was a which was a group of ex Republicans who want to set up a new party. So there's a you know and they were I mean I'm not going to say they were all people that you've heard of, but they were sort of some were members of Congress and some were journalists and uh, you know so there is a that thought has been kicking around for a long time, maybe for four years at least. Um, I mean, the difficulty, as you know, is that our political system is not set up to make that easy. Um, you know, the way our voting system works, um, it, it very much discourages third parties. Um, and it, it, it's simply very difficult for a third party to win. I mean, it sometimes happens at the state level. Um, either a third party or an independent candidate can sometimes win. Um, you know, we've seen some state elections where that's happened, Senate elections and governor elections. Um, but it's, it's, it's made difficult by the way we count our votes and by the way we work. So, I mean, so I would say that what's more likely to happen, um, and this is also what's happened in the past, is that the Republican Party 
transforms itself in one direction or the other. I mean, it will, there will now be an argument over who controls it, who speaks for it. Um, and um, no, I mean, and I, and I actually don't know what the outcome will be. I mean, but there is a, but, you know, and, and remember that we've had, you know, the parties have had major changes in the past. You know, what we think of as Democrats and the Democrat coalition was totally different 60 years ago. And those of you who know American history will know that the Democrats um, were once the party of the segregationist South, um, that, you know, Democrats in the South were, were, um, were you know, opposed to the civil rights movement. Um, and it was really only after Lyndon Johnson's Civil Rights Act um, that there was this transformation of the, of the parties. And many, many black Americans voted for the Republicans because it was Lincoln's party um, in the first half of the 20th century and then gradually shift their votes to the Democratic party as, you know, but so they, you know, they kind of, the parties kind of switch places. So it's not unheard of for them to change in very radical ways. I mean, were the Republican party to become a radical party and, you know, a party that was openly authoritarian. I mean, it's heading that way right now that would be very disturbing because, you know, we're a two party system. Sooner or later, people get sick of Democrats and they want to vote for someone else. And so that is how autocratic parties have won in other places. That's how they won in Poland. I mean, that, um, you know, people get tired of the ruling party and it's natural in democracy for there to be some kind of rotation. So the idea that we would have as our main opposition party, um, a, a party committed to autocracy that didn't believe in, you know, counting votes and I mean, this is, this is, it's very disturbing and very dangerous. And this is how democracy has fallen in other places. Right. So uh, several questions here, I'm gonna to try to combine them into to one, I think at the, the most basic level, you know, where do you see uh, capitalism and economic inequality fitting into the, the picture you're painting about democratic erosion and the, and, and the rise of, of authoritarianism? So you have to be careful about economics because um, we are, in a, in a weird way, we are all Marxists in that for, um, everybody likes and wants and prefers to see politics through an economic lens because that also gives us the feeling that we can solve things. I mean, if the problem is inequality and we could solve inequality, then we solve the problem. You see what I mean? And that seems like a matter of taxation and you know, and then, then you get a clear set of policy choices. Um, and so while I would say that inequality is a huge problem for all of our societies and it's a much bigger problem in the United States than in, you know, in, in many other countries, um, it's not the only problem. I mean, inequality does have the effect of, I mean, it has corrupted our party system in our democracy in a number of ways. I mean, you know, wealthy people and the, and it's not even inequality actually, it's the campaign finance system um, and the existence of dark money in US politics, I think is, is a, responsible for a huge amount of corruption. Um, and the numerous attempts to end that and change that that have failed are actually quite tragic. Um, you know, John McCain, uh, the late John McCain spent a lot of his career trying to fix this. Um, and never managed it. I mean, it was one of the, other than the thing, his foreign policy thing, you know, positions which are better known. Um, this was a thing he spent a lot of time on um, and, it, and, and he failed. And our inability to fix that means that money in politics is very distorting um, and bad for democracy. I mean, I would also say that, um, I would say, as I said, that economic change and the redistribution of wealth and status has also had a, big effect on democracy. And this, this plays into some of the things I said um, a few minutes ago. I mean, the, you know, although many of Trump, you know, the poorest Americans voted for Joe Biden, um, many of the middle-class people who voted for Trump are people who feel either for economic or for cultural reasons that they've somehow lost out, um, that they aren't, you know, the pie isn't growing as fast, their kids aren't doing as well as they did, you know, they don't see, a, you know, they, they aren't on this upward path to prosperity that so many Americans felt they were on for so many decades. Um, and it's the resentment of that class actually, that is, uh, you know, even though many of them have pretty good incomes or live in, own their own, their own houses and they have cars, um, it's the lack of a trajectory and this feeling of comparative loss 
um, that makes them angry, but they are not the poorest people in the country. They were not, we're not talking about homeless people. We're not talking about um, you know, the working poor. I mean, we're talking about the middle class. Um, so, so the, so, you know, the, the, you know, although, as I said, I think inequality is a serious problem, particularly because it affects, um, it affects politics through the means of, of, of campaign financing. Um, I am not sure that the only, you know, the way to fix American democracy is to fix inequality, if that makes sense. I mean, I don't think it's the only answer. It's part of the answer. Right. So thinking about it from a, a, a public discourse perspective, I mean, what what is the the best or, or a good counter argument to combat that sense of, of disappointment and, and lack of trajectory that, that you were just describing? So that's a you know, that's kind of the million dollar question. <laughs> um, how, you know, and it comes that question comes in different forms. Um, one, one form it sometimes comes in is what are we going to do about the anti-systemic part of the Republican Party, the people, not just the people who are at the Capitol on January the 6th, but the people who support them, which is still a high number. I mean, one poll said 20%, which would be extraordinary. Um, maybe it's not really that high. Maybe it's 10%, even though that's a large number of Americans, um, you know, or whatever, the 30% of the Republican Party who thinks Trump won the election. Um, so how do we speak to them? How do we reach them? That's that's um, that's one way to look at the question, and then the other way is, um, uh, you know, how do we, um, how do, you know, how do we, how do we rebuild consensus? How do we rebuild the sense that our democracy belongs to all of us, and it's one country, and we may have differences of opinions, but we're all patriots? Um, how do we, how do we rebuild that? And they have they have sort of different answers. Um, um, you know, I just wrote a piece um, that not everybody liked. Um, which was about, which which was an argument based on the experience of a place like Northern Ireland um, or Colombia, places where they you had a real violent insurgency, and you had to knit the country back together then again. Um, and one of the arguments that you get from people who've studied those situations and people who worked in post-conflict situations is that the the you know what you really need to do is not continue your culture war or you know get everybody into the same room and have them talk it out because it's not going to work and no one's ever going to get along. The, what you should really do is change the subject. So talk about something else, you know, talk, get the country to focus on something that at least we all care about. And this, by the way, um, does appear to be the strategy of the Biden administration. You have not heard Biden talk about Trump. He didn't talk about impeachment. Um, he, and, you know, and when he's asked about it, he brushes the subject away. Um, and he did that during the election campaign too. Um, and against the advice of many people, by the way. I mean, there's there's a lot of anger out there at Trump and a lot of people get energy from that anger. Um, and you know, there, you know, there, there were a lot of people who wanted to campaign with that anger. And of course, some people did in their own ways. Um, but he seems to be of the view that, um, you know, as I said, as the peacemakers in Northern Ireland concluded that the bet that's not the way. Um, to end the problem. And so what he's going to try to do, I think, is I understand his strategy from what he said in public and from what people I know who work for him say, um, as, he under as I understand it, the idea is get people to focus on the coronavirus, the vaccines, the economy. Um, and he, that's one of the reasons why he wants a, you know, a big economic package that people will actually feel. You know, it can't be you know, a, a couple of hundred dollars checks for a few people, it has to be something big. And, and, the, and then I'm sure there will be other big things to come. I imagine there's a healthcare program to come. And I think, I mean, one of the things I worry about Biden, um, and this will also be not popular probably among some of your audience, is that one of the issues that could reignite the culture war and make everybody angry again, would be if he tries to do a big immigration reform package now, if he tries to do it in the next year. Um, he sort of hinted at that a few weeks ago, and there are a lot of people in his party who want it, and I understand why. And you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not disputing. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying I don't. I mean, it was one of the worst things. Um, the most horrific elements of the Trump administration was the immigration policy, and of course, the separation of families. Um, however, um, trying to make big steps in that direction right now, while we're as divided and as angry as we are, I think could reinflame the culture war. And so I hope he won't do it. I hope he'll wait um, until until there's a better moment. But but as I say, that's the 
that tactic is one thing. I mean, there's another, there's another set of tactics, which um, I'm borrowing actually from a woman who I quote a lot in my book. Woman, there's, a, there's a sort of, I think she's technically a behavioral economist, but she's really more a sociologist called Karen Stenner. Um, whose work I cite a lot, and she writes a lot about the authoritarian predisposition that many people have, and and why they have it, and and what can what can trigger it. Um, and one of her answers to what do you do about people who have this nostalgia and anger and grievance, um, and who feel society breaking apart in ways, and who are upset by the overload of information and the kind of cacophony on the airwaves, um, one of the things you do is you present them with displays of unity, um, you talk about patriotism, um, you include them in big unifying narratives. Um, I mean, she says even literally, you know, getting people to wear uniforms and march in rows. And, you know, if they see, um, you know, if they, if they see some cause that they can be part of and they can identify with, and that seems unified, um, uh, and seems, homo you know, in some way, in some element, I don't, I, I don't want to use the word homogenous, but, and I don't want to keep repeating unified, but there, if there's some form of togetherness they can be part of, um, then you might be able to win them over. And, you know, how this translates into real policy, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe, um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, the Super Bowl seems to me to do a pretty good job of that. I don't know. Not everybody liked the I didn't watch the game, I, you know, but I, I love the Super Bowl pregame. And so I watched the, you know, they had the two singers, they had um, to sing the national anthem, they had a country and Western singer and a black R&B singer doing a duet. And some people hated it for musical reasons. I, of course, thought it was great because this is exactly the, you know, can you get everyone to sing in harmony? You know, can you pull in? I mean, I think Biden tried to do that as inauguration as well. Um, can you offer people? I mean, essentially what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to offer people who feel somehow excluded from America or they don't see their future here or they're afraid of what it means to have Democrats in charge or people of other races in charge. You need to give them a sense that they too will have a future in this America. Um, and you need, to, you need to tell them, give them that message symbolically. Maybe you need to do it through policy. Um, Anyway, that's the those are the those are those are the answers that I have. I mean, those are the those are the answers if you're if you're campaigning, and there may be other policy answers too. Sure. Um, also, a, a a common theme to to some of the the questions here about the role that uh, changing demographics in the U.S. play in in this picture. I mean, how how do you kind of keep your eyes on the prize of that that message of unity given? you know, how much demographics have changed and will continue to change over the next couple of decades. It's extremely hard. Um, and demographic change, um, which, you know, by the way, I'm in favor of, and I would much rather live in a, you know, in a society full of diverse people because you know, I've spent most of my life living in foreign countries or countries that were foreign to me. They're not when I was, you know, growing up. Um, and so I'm very happy, you know, being around people who are strange and who speak different languages. Um, Lots of people aren't, um, and again, that's a you know finding ways to make them comfortable with this new America, um, in, in you know persuading them that they won't be left out of it. Um, I, and, and I'm sure that you know there is a, there's a difficulty here because of course the the you you know the innate reaction is to say well they're racists, um, and that may well be true. Um, However, they're still here. <laughs> um, they live here, you know, they vote, they're Americans, um, and we need some way to integrate them and make them feel part of the polity. Um, and that doesn't mean we need to tolerate racism, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, but we need to make sure that we don't exclude, you know, you know, exclude either in our rhetoric or in our, in our policy, we don't exclude parts of America. Um, um, I mean, there's a whole nother long conversation to have actually about, about institutional change. I mean, I would, I would also, um, I, you know, I think in a way, one of the, you know, the, the fact of our, you know, our very skewed Senate, um, which in which rural America is overrepresented, I forget the statistics, but it's something like a rural voter has four times as much power as an urban voter because of 
you know, California having two senators and Wyoming having two senators as well. Um, something about that has, I think, has actually damaged the Republican Party because the Republican Party sees that it can win. It can almost win. It almost, you know, it can almost sometimes win national elections. It can win a lot of state elections and therefore it can have a lot of national power without having to appeal to a broad constituency and without having to speak to black and brown and urban Americans, um, or at least not, not everywhere. Um, and, and that, you know, that, you know, there's a way in which I know this sounds odd, but if we could change that, you know, if we could get DC statehood and Puerto Rican statehood and, um, you know, we could, and we, and the, and the Republican party was forced to compete in urban areas or in non-white, non-historically white areas, um, I think it'd be good for the party um, and it would make it, it would make it healthier and it would, you know, but, but that's a, that's kind of a pipe dream I have. I mean, that's a, that's, that's a long way away, but it is, but it's also a kind of answer. Yeah. And, and I mean, I guess on a, on a more practical level, do you see an opportunity for the center right and the center left in the, in the U S to kind of work in, in coalition on some of those reform types of of issues. So I think we, you know, we might see that. Um, we, we just saw in the impeachment vote that there is a small but significant group of Republicans who are willing to work with Democrats. Um, it wasn't enough to break, you know, to, to um, convict Trump. Um, and it's right, I mean, the moment doesn't look like it's enough to break a filibuster. And that's, by the way, another institution we could talk about changing, um, um, which wasn't in the Constitution and isn't old and wasn't invented by Thomas Jefferson. Um, but, but, but there is, but it's certainly, I mean, I think that those Republicans do represent the center right. I mean, they, they speak for that constituency inside the Republican party. And there may be, there may be some way to work together. I just, you know, I don't know how the numbers add up and, and it, you know, but probably depend from, from bill to bill. Um, I mean, we don't have a multi-party system, you know, so there isn't a way, as I was, you know, as we've already discussed for the Republican party to easily break up into two and that would allow for some coalition building, you know, in a formal coalition building, but maybe there's some informal coalition building that could be done at the state level, maybe in Congress, maybe in the Senate. Mm -hmm. So are, are there um, historical parallels that we can look to uh, about the current state of affairs in, in the US that results in a, a strengthening of democracy, dampening of political divisions without violent conflict? It seems if we look through history, violence uh, you know, enters the picture somewhere. So there are, yes, sadly, quite a lot of, you know, very polarized societies end up having civil wars. I mean, I won't, um, I'm not gonna try and, you know, paint <laughs> for a nicer picture. Um, and very often these very polarized societies, the, the polarization ends when one side defeats the other in battle. I mean, that literally is what happens in, in most places. When you look around and you see the, there are very few other little examples. One of them I've mentioned already is Northern Ireland, um, which, did overcome a very bitter and violent division, partly by changing the subject, partly by getting everybody involved in the political process, um, bringing in former terrorists and electing them to a local local assembly, um, you know, making a, you know, giving people different roles. And there's also another very, I mean, I actually had an argument with a Canadian about this last night, so I'm on shakier ground here. But if you look at if you look generally at it. Um, another interesting one um, is what happened in Quebec um, in the 60s and 70s. So Quebec was a, is obviously a province of Canada. It's French and English speaking. Um, there was at one point there developed a very a genuinely violent separatist movement in Quebec, which sought you know, to break off from the rest of Canada. Um, and my understanding of how that was resolved is um, you know, um, partly because the, you know, the actions of the Canadian government kind of consciously or unconsciously said, all right, we're going to deal with this problem. Let's now break it up into 47 different parts. Let's talk about, you know, road signs, schools, libraries, you know, statues, you know, let's, then let's have a committee for each one of these things, you know, and so they got everyone to, you know, and eventually the whole thing became so boring, you know, that, um, that the, you know, the conflict kind of died down and people lost interest in it. And, French Canadians saw they could have their statues and they could have some street names and, you know, they could have some French language schools and they 
and it, you know, and, and, the, and the thing sort of went away. Um, and so that's another, again, there's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in, in Canadian politics, but that's another model of a place that ended, you know, ended these kind of conflicts. But mm -hmm. I, but it's true, there aren't a lot of models and there's not a lot of, you know, there aren't a lot, it, it, it will require, you know, great wisdom on the part of a lot of people um, to end this conflict. Um, right. you know. And also I, I see you know, another point, of course, Canada, you know, Ireland being a, one version of it is very often these conflicts end with the outside intervention. You know, someone else steps in and says, let's be peacemaker. And I've had a lot of amusing conversations with people trying to think who would be, you know, what Justin Trudeau comes and he negotiates, you know, between Republicans and Democrats, or I don't know, we get Mexico to help us. I mean, <laughs> who, who is it who steps in to negotiate in the United States? I don't know. But, uh, right. Anyway. So you you've talked throughout about this this notion of we can't treat democracy like it's running water that's always going to be there. And I, I think that over the past four years, that message has has become clear in in the US, at least depending on what types of media sources you consume, which that's a whole other conversation we could have. But I'm I'm wondering how how that not treating democracy like running water message resonates or is being heard outside the US. And in, in some of the other countries that you you've written about and have studied, so there has been. I mean, um, you know, sometimes I guess it's the case that people have to suddenly realize that these things touch them personally before they care. Um, there's an interesting example over the last several years in Poland. Um, the, the 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 ruling party's attack on the court system actually happened in 2015 and 2016. Um, and at that time, there were really big demonstrations. There were lots of people went on the street to protest the attack on the courts and people stood outside that lit candles outside the courts and so on. Um, but almost everybody at those demonstrations was middle-aged. I mean, it was literally the, it was this anti-communist generation who understood why courts were important and who, you know, because if you think about it, this, the, this topic of independence of the courts is fairly abstract. I mean, it doesn't affect you when you walk down the street, whether the courts are independent or not, you know, why should you care? Um, you know, fast forward a few years later, we recently had a decision taken by one of the packed courts, the, the constitutional tribunal, which whose, whose character was completely changed illegally, you know, and unconstitutionally um, by the government. And they made a decision that affected um, I won't go into all the details, but it affected abortion and reproductive rights. Um, suddenly, you know, there were once again mass demonstrations, except this time they were young people and they were people, you know, very young people. Uh, I saw in several places, 16, 17, 18, um, and lots of people in their 20s and 30s, because they had finally understood that, you know, this abstract issue of independent courts affected them personally. Um, and so now you have a, you know, a higher level. I mean, it's a little late, unfortunately, because one of the, you know, one of the issues in Poland is the very, very low level of voting among young people. Um, but I hope, you know, I'm hoping that this generational experience of seeing how this, um, you know, seeing how, seeing what damage can be done um, will persuade lots of younger people to vote next time. Right. Great. Well, uh, one one final question here, but uh, before we we wrap things up, um, what I know it it seemed we ha we did just just have an election, but it seems like the the conversation about the next election start earlier and earlier. And there's a question here about what what are you going to be watching as we head toward 2022 and even into 2024. So I think it's way too early to talk about 2024 even for Americans. I mean, I I just I think that our view of Trump and Trumpism is gonna evolve a lot in the next few years. Um, he's gonna spend a lot of time in court. Um, one of the, I thought, I mean, really extraordinary moments of the last few days was after Mitch McConnell voted to not to convict Trump, he made an extraordinary speech in which he effectively said, you know, these decisions in America aren't taken in the Senate, they're taken in criminal courts, so sue him, you know? I mean, literally said, you know, invited people to sue Donald Trump, whether it was people who had relatives, you know, injured or, or even killed in the, in the Capitol, you know, or in some other way. So, you know, and, you know, that, 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 has, you know, there have to be a million lawyers now scrambling to 
to, you know, all, all they have to do is walk into the court and say that, you know, the Republic leader of the Republicans in the Senate said I could sue you, you know, and that's you know, I don't know, pretty big. Um, it's a, um, uh, you know, it's a pretty good recommendation. Um, so I think that will happen. I think um, views of him will change as time goes on. Um, you know, I hope that Biden is successful in changing the subject, um, you know, that he can get us to focus on. And I also think that once the pandemic is over, assuming that the pandemic is over, I don't wanna just be too optimistic. Um, once, you know, the vaccines have kicked in, um, you know, I'm hoping that a burst of economic growth, or at least even if it's not that, even it's just a return to some kind of normality and an end to this weird world where we all talk to each other on Zoom. <laughs> Um, I'm hoping that that gives people a sense of optimism that leads them, you know, in different directions, um, you know, and, and it ends this, you know, because I do feel that all these problems have been multiplied by the pandemic, by the isolation, by the weirdness, um, you know, even the conspiracy theories, it's so clear mm -hmm. that they, can't, you know, that, you know, this disease is an invisible thing that circulates, you know, and, you know, and there's so much we don't know about it, you know, it's not very surprising that people create you know theories about it and imagine it to be doing things that it's not and so on so i think that will that will return us to i, I don't want to say that i don't want to go back to where we were or some kind of status quo ante but it will it might help make conversation more normal well great well thank you everyone for uh your questions i i know there were some that we didn't get to i'm recording an interview with ann for our podcast uh later this afternoon so you can Tune in there. I'll try to get to as many of them as I can in there. But uh, Anne, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. It was delightful. I, I appreciate your time and, and thank you so much.